I'm Marcus, and you're about to watch horror filmmakers, writers, and actors share their real-life spooky stories. What you might not know is that all the amazing people in this Halloween special are actually guests on our new show, The Grim Exchange, where we'll be bringing you all the latest horror entertainment news. So if you want to know what's going on in the world of horror, meet filmmakers and have a chat, and have some fun along the way, tune in to our first episode on Friday the 13th. Without further ado, let's get spooky. So when I was about 11 years old, I was in a car with my family, my mum, my dad, my brother, uh, and we were in the seaside town of Western Supermare, which is in the West Country in the southwest of England. Uh, we were driving past the churchyard and we were, the car was following a bus. I remember distinctly we were following a bus. And as we drove past the churchyard, a movement caught my eye and I looked across and there was a woman uh, dressed completely in white, flowing white clothes. Her arms, her face were, were, were deathly, pastely white. Um, and I said to my family, look at that woman. And they all said, what woman? And, and saw nothing. Um, and everybody thought I was making it up and that was that and everybody just ignored me. It was, it was Pete talking about ghost stories, whatever. And then a week later, my grandmother contacted us. In those days, it was a phone call and a letter because it was long before the days of the internet. There'd been a letter in the local paper in Western Supermare from a woman who'd been on the bus, who'd written in saying that she'd seen a woman in white walking through the graveyard and nobody else on the bus had seen her and was wondering if there were any other witnesses. I don't know if she was a ghost, maybe she was just a bit weird, but either way, uh, it's one of the things that makes me believe there's something else going on there. there. A ghostly thing that happened to me when I was maybe 17 years old, maybe 16 years old, and I kind of brought this one on myself, um, was that I was making a short horror movie and it was about a Ouija board and it was about people that play with a Ouija board. So one of the props I needed for the film was a Ouija board. Um, and it was my high school, actually, uh, they were funding my movies, I had a grant, so with their money I ordered this, uh, this proper uh, Ouija board from like the 70s uh, from America, I got it on eBay and I got it shipped over, and if you ever watch these films like Ouija and stuff like that, they always have this board, this was like the one, and I'd done my research, I wanted, I, I didn't want like one of these modern and you know one of these fancy modern ones that you kind of get now that the sort of all pretty I wanted the old board that got banned back in the day so that's what I got and that's what came um, and for research for the movie I thought well let's play it and I, I have played the Ouija board this particular one about three times um, and only this one time did something weird actually happen um, but anyway it was a it was a wintry night and we were uh, me and uh, three friends, yeah, me and three girls, um, we were all in this little cottage, all the lights out, it was a proper like old cottage and right opposite, literally you could see through the window of where we were, was the church and the graveyard and all this stuff, so it was the perfect setting. Um, and we lit a candle and got the board out, and the way we were going to do it, and this was how I'd written it in my script as well, um, was that two people would play the Ouija board um, and they would have to not just be blindfolded but have pillowcases put over their heads so that literally there was no possible way you could see because I thought if you can see the, the letters you're going to be cheating like you can spell out what you like um, so the rules were we'd play, we'd play it for like 20 minutes we'd have the pillowcases on our head one person would be able to see and they'd have a pen and paper and they'd be the one answering the questions. So you'd be talking to the spirit or whatever for 20 minutes and then you'd take the pillowcase off and then you'd look at the, you know, what was all written down. And a lot of the time it would just be complete gobbledygook because nothing was coming out and you'd be like, oh, what a waste of 20 minutes. Um, the other girl, she refused to play it so she just sat in the corner um, and watched. But there was one time we played it um, and it did seem to communicate with uh, someone who had died. Uh, and, and I mean, I won't go into the details of what it said because that would be disrespectful to the person, uh, the friend of mine, who um, actually was playing with the board and, and was communicating with this person. But I didn't even know that my friend was so close with someone who had, who had actually died. I had no idea. Um, but anyway, what was, I won't go into the details of what was said, um, but it seemed very convincing that 
this person was actually making some sort of contact. Maybe uh, even with the pillowcase on their head, maybe they still psychologically kind of knew where the letters were on the board. So maybe they were, you know, even blind, maybe they could still spell out these messages. Um, who knows? Who knows how the Ouija board works? But the part that was unexplainable and possibly supernatural and that freaked me out was when we made contact with this particular person, um, every time, you know, you've got your hands uh, on the planchette, every time it moved when we were talking to this person, the candle that was, that was lit right between us uh, on, on the sort of next to the board, the flame would go absolutely crazy. Like, not quite the exorcist crazy where it goes everywhere, but it was, it was like someone was leaning right next to it, blowing on it, and there were sparks flying off it. Like, no exaggeration, the thing was, it was like spitting. It's like when a, when a wick of a candle gets wet, um, it was like spitting sparks and bits of flames, and it was making such a loud noise. Only when the thing moved though, so it'd be moving and, and the candle would be going crazy and then the thing would stop moving and the candle would just be still. And then my friend would ask another question and you'd wait and then as soon as that thing started moving again, the candle would be going, the flame would be going completely wild, completely crazy. Um, which I can't explain, like that, uh, that was very strange. Hello. Hi, I'm uh, Drew Pierce, uh, the co-writer director of The Wretched. Um, and here is one of my favorite scary stories. Um, when I first moved out to LA um, with my brother, my, my co-director, we, um, we had several other roommates and one of our roommates was obsessed with everything scary. He, he believed that he had like seen so many ghosts and then he became convinced that there was a ghost in our apartment that was like opening and closing doors and was standing over him at times. Um, and it kind of creeped us out. We would hear weird creaks and different things in the apartment. But then, you know, as you do, we all split off and got our own apartments and started dating people. And he, he started dating another friend of ours, a girl. And they, <laughs> ironically, she was that person too. She believed in every ghost story anybody had ever told her. And they, every time we went camping or did anything with the, the, this couple friend of ours, they'd basically, you know, insist that there was something haunted or something creepy. So then one time they went back to Michigan close to Halloween and they decided to do the classic thing, walk through a graveyard. And her friend snapped a bunch of pictures of them. And in one of the pictures, freaked us all out. At first, there was a <laughs> skull behind um, behind them and it was it was like this misty shape that looked behind them almost as if like the fog had created this like skull looking shape behind him like a harbinger of death and right in the center of the the misty shape there were two glowing lights way in the distance like they were houses and it freaked them out big time and for several years they would tell that story um, and then we decided to reveal to them after several years we just couldn't take it. We had doctored those photos in Photoshop and uploaded them ourselves. Um, so I think I've always been a little bit of a skeptic, but uh, I want to see something scary someday. But that's my favorite scary story. This one time I was living in LA uh, a few years ago. I was living um, in the Hollywood Hills, uh, renting out with a friend, uh, a famous horror film film director's house and the house was spooky. There was something haunted about it. Um, and uh, she was, she was in the upstairs room. I was downstairs near the garden and we were there for a couple of weeks and it was fine. And then she started to just feel like there was too much happening in her room at night that she wanted to leave. And I didn't really want to leave because um, I didn't want to live in that house on my own. She'd go to sleep at night and the mattress would sink under her and uh, she'd feel this, this energy up, up there. And I said, don't worry, I can, I can clear spirits. I'll, I'll come and clear your room, which is full of, full of crap. But I, I grabbed some uh, leaves from outside and lit them up and started fake saging her room and walked around and asked the spirit to leave. I said, hey, spirit, please. 
whatever you need to do, you don't need to do it here. Your time is up. If you need to leave this place, out you go. And um, I said, there you go. It's clear. You're, you're good. You're good to, you're good to stay. Um, and then that night, she went to sleep and she had some keys on her bedside table that picked up in the middle of the night and were thrown across the room and hit the wall. And she woke up. She was like, that's it. I'm out. And uh, she didn't even tell me she was leaving. She texted me the next day. She said, you're, you're right. You're there on your own. Place is yours. <laughs> I'm out. Um, so another thing that happens with my mother and I are these psychic dreams. Um, so my psychic dreams are typically really rubbish, <laughs> like terrible dreams. So I actually... Um, had a dream about the Colbert themed Ben and Jerry's ice cream before it came out. And I think I even told my sister about this dream when it happened and just said, why do I have these dumb dreams? And then um, like a week later, I think, or within the same week, there's a big announcement. Um, and uh, my sister called me and she's like, oh my God, the ice cream. And I was like, I know, why can't it be lottery numbers or something useful? Um, my mother actually has, I guess, a little bit more useful or more interesting psychic dreams. So uh, one night uh, she started screaming um, in her sleep and I went into her room and she was sat up straight and she said, oh God, oh God, I dreamt that there was a house on fire and I don't know if there were people inside and she just, ugh, just made her feel awful and she had to get up and walk around. And then the next night or the next morning, when we, um, when we got up and we went outside, down at the very far end of the street, which was like, um, uh, kind of like went up on an incline, the house at the very top of the hill was burnt to the ground. Um, so it, I assume it was burning while she was sleeping. Um, I don't know if we couldn't smell anything from where we were, but uh, luckily nobody died. I think that like there are certain cultures where the threat of the supernatural or ghosts is used to correct children. And like, I am a product of one of those. So like, if we were bad, my grandmother was like, I will haunt you. Mm -hmm. Like, and I believed her. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it did keep us in line. <laughs> yeah. I didn't really grow up with that stuff like that like in my family there's the evil, evil eye. eye but i mean like i didn't really care too much about that because it's not like they tried to scare us with the evil eye it was just something that happened if you're like oh, are you sick someone gave you the evil eye let's do this weird ritual and we'll find out who it was and then you could go and talk to them and confront them and then you won't be sick anymore I'm like i'm sure that won't happen but let's see um supposedly i gave the evil eye to my sister all the time and that's why my sister was sick um but as for spooky stories um I've had a few. I, I think for a while I was suffering from sleep paralysis. And so I never really knew that what that meant or what that was until recently, because we happened to watch a documentary about it. Um, but I was living in Halifax, which is like East Coast Canada. And Halifax is a very old place. And I guess there's a lot of ghosts there. It's where most of the people from the Titanic are born, uh, are buried, um, because that's the only ice-free port along there. So I guess when the Titanic sunk, that's where they brought all the people. So there's tons of cemeteries there. It's also uh, where we had a huge explosion. Yeah, the Halifax explosion was part of like Canadian history where a munitions boat during the war during the war came pretty much close to shore and exploded and it took off like a mile and a half of Halifax was destroyed. And there's still places in, in that city where you see like pieces from the boat stuck in trees and the tree has grown over or they've kept them in buildings just to kind of keep them there and remind remind people of what happened but i lived in halifax for only six months and uh, a woman i was dating at the time uh, worked on a radio show so she was getting up at like 4 30 in the morning to go to work to be like the host of the morning show which was like five to nine or something like that and so she would wake up and she would get ready and of course i would stay in bed sometimes i'd obviously wake up due to the alarm and then she would leave and I would fall back asleep and um, she left and I was kind of dozing off again and then she came back into the room and I was like oh what what are you doing and she climbed into the bed and just kind of laid on top of me and I was like is everything okay and then I kind of got out from the sheet and looked over and there was a woman standing next to my bed bent over just like this like staring directly at me 
and then I like I threw off the covers and then there was no one in the room and I just like ran out to the hallway and switched all the lights on and so that happened once and then a couple weeks later it was a very similar thing but this time what happened was I felt a hand on my back just push me into the bed and I couldn't get up and so like those were kind of my two weird possible ghost experiences, possible sleep paralysis experiences that happened to me in Halifax while I lived there for six months. A haunted city. Haunted city. Okay, well, this is not my story. It's my friend's story and her daughter's story. And I'm glad it's not my story. As the daughter tells it, she came home early from school and she was delighted because the door was open and she got in so much trouble, it left the door open a couple of times from my friend, her mother. Um, and now she gets to rub it in like, you are the one who left the door open this time, ha ha ha. So um, she didn't want to start whatever it was that they were going to be doing. And so together, so she lay down on the bed and fell asleep. And my friend comes home and the door's open and you know she starts yelling because she's understandably upset about this door thing. Um, so she comes stomping over to the daughter's room and she hits the threshold and didn't say anything. And the daughter was like, what was it? <laughs> well, how much trouble am I in to herself? You know? And then my friend says, grandma fell, she's in the hospital. Get your shoes on, we have to go right now. And the daughter says, why didn't she say so before? And you know, grabs her shoes. They bolt out of the door, they get into the car. My friend drives away about a block, pulls over and says, call 911. And the daughter says, why? Grandma's already in the hospital, it's okay. And, and uh, my friend says, there was a man under your bed with a large butcher knife. So, Needless to say, the cops, by the time they got there, the guy was long gone. But uh, unfortunately, there is also, at this time, a series of murders and a knife is being used. And what they couldn't understand was how this person, guy or woman, was getting into the house, houses of these people, without breaking the door, you know, um, breaking in. And they never caught the guy but we know how he's getting in the door without breaking in. The door is open. So, lock your doors. Hello? My name is Faith Monique. This is a true story. One day, I was in my home and I was recording some music. I was on my piano and I was playing and singing the song Redeemer. I was the only one at home. My husband had just gotten off work. He was on his way home. Towards the end of my song, I started hearing noises. No one had entered our home. So I thought nothing of it. So I continued to play. I continued to sing. But all of a sudden, no lie, I heard the shower. The shower started going off. I began to panic. Not just panic. I began to scream. <laughs> Who is in my home? We've never had a robbery. This has never happened to me before. What's happening? So I ran to the kitchen. I grabbed this hammer. And I started to go towards the bed. I've never killed anybody before. I've never even hit anybody before. What am I gonna do if someone's in my home? I opened the bathroom door. I crept towards the shower. The shower's going, man. It's going strong. Someone is in the shower. I start to open the shower. Ah! 
it was my husband. I said, babe, when did you get home? He said, I've been home. I've been home for like five minutes. You were singing. It was so loud. I didn't want to disrupt you. So I just went in the shower and I was going to greet you when I came out. I'm like, dude, I almost killed you. He goes, well, I'm glad you didn't do that. I'm like, come on, man. Yeah, so that's a true story. And it's one of the scariest moments of my life. One, I thought someone was in my home. And for two, I almost killed my husband. Yeah, so happy Halloween, everybody.